Hey guys. Uh, glad to be back. Uh, good to see you all. Um, I just wanted to have or give you a couple of announcements. Um, I still need baptism certificates. Uh, if you could just get those to me as soon as possible, um, that would be great. You can email them to me if that works best for you guys. Um, and then I wanted to remind you of the mass, the teaching mass next weekend that Father just announced uh, this morning. So it's going to be at 5 o'clock, and I encourage you guys to come. Um, I had, over the last couple weeks, I had some uh, of the Journey of Faith, the Places in the Church um, pamphlets out. So hopefully you got one of those. If you didn't, uh, just let me know. I do have a few extras. So does anybody need one of those pamphlets? Anybody? Okay, I'll bring you one. Um, and then, let's see, the second thing I wanted to, or third thing that I wanted to tell you was, um, I can't remember right now. Well, he's trying to remember that. It does count. So you don't have to go to mass in the morning and then come back at five o'clock. Five o'clock will fulfill your obligation for that, for next weekend for Sunday mass. Oh, the other thing was, sorry, I kind of messed up. I gave you guys the first reconciliation uh, pamphlet early. So I, and I forgot to give you the sacrament of holy order or not holy orders, um, holy anointing or anointing of the sick. So that's why there's all those pamphlets. So today we're doing holy matrimony and holy orders. Next weekend we'll do uh, confession or reconciliation and uh, anointing of the sick. So sorry for the confusion there. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I had COVID brain or something. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so if you need anything, let me know, guys. And like I said, glad to be back. And uh, I am feeling a lot better. So um, thank you for your, your kind emails and, and messages. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Joe. He's going to talk to us about holy orders and matrimony. Thank you. Uh, first thing we do is we're going to start with a prayer. So let me find my. Of everybody understands what love is, right? So we're we're going to go and see what uh, Paul said about it in Colossians. <clears throat> so, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also do. And over all these, put on love, that is, the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts, the peace into which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> So we've done some other stuff and talked about baptism, of Holy Eucharist, uh, confirmation. Does anybody have any questions about any of that stuff that didn't get answered or you thought of since then that we need to cover real quick or something? Of course, today is going to be busy because we're throwing two pamphlets at you the same day. Uh, so today, those are the three sacraments of what? Initiation. Initiation. So that's what we go through, baptism of Eucharist and uh, of confirmation to be come full members and participate fully in the body of Christ. Now we're ready to be witnesses to Christ. And so we have the today we're talking about the two of their service, sometimes referred to, sometimes are referred to as uh, the of vocation sacraments. And so the, this is our opportunity to participate and witness in the church in these sacraments. They help us to be what we learned and went through in uh, the, the initiation sacraments. So, of uh, is there anybody in here that's married? So you guys all, everybody does everything 50-50, right? Because is that how that works? I've had a partnership before and we were 50-50. He did half the stuff and I did half the stuff, but it didn't seem to work that way in marriage. Sometimes I feel like I do everything 
and sometimes my wife does everything, and then sometimes we're both doing everything. So uh, marriage is one of those deals where we don't, um, we don't get to be partway in and partway out and say, I, I did my stuff. I did my 50% today. We don't get to persist, participate that way. So when we start talking about marriage, I put up there love versus hate. Of, and then I also wrote over to the side that TOB, Theology of the Body. Is anybody in here familiar with Theology of the Body? Does anybody want to give it a, a I mean, it, it's a great, well, since there's not very, very many hands raised, Theology of the Body, uh, Pope John Paul II on his Tuesday or Wednesday audiences when he would get, go and speak from the window at the Vatican and talk to everybody, whoever was out in St. Peter's Square, he talked about this over three years time period, I think, theology of the body. And so people took his talks and put them in. He had, for somebody who was uh, not ever married, didn't have much of a family life growing up. If you know anything about him, his parents died when he was young, lost his brother. Of, so his whole family was gone by the time he was 17 or 18. And he ended up having to find his own path in the world. Of course, they did teach him uh, about Catholicism. And so he had a base to stand on. And of course, he lived through occupation in Poland from uh, the com you know, communist regimes. So he had a lot of things of, well, the actually German was in there first and then uh, Russia came in. And so he had a lot of things that he had to deal with just to become a priest and stuff. So he had a lot of wisdom and he could see the relationships of people. And so anyway, I, I encourage you, if you haven't ever done it, of, to find a copy of Theology of the Body I've read some other books. This is what we use to teach the teens. And that's what I wrote the authors for. Of This is much more plain and direct <laughs> than some of the other books that you get that are written for d adults. That, you know, there's so much to unpack. It's really, it just takes a long time to get understand what they're trying to say. And this is pretty direct. So I don't know. With all that, we'll say then of, so what is love? That's a great definition, willing the good of another. Is it always that way? If it's, if it's love, it's always that way. <laughs> right. So who, who showed us the example of perfect love? There's two people I know of that did it perfectly. One with lots of grace, he was full of grace, and the other one, he gave himself up on the cross for us. The ultimate... Yeah, Mary and Jesus, yeah. The ultimate act of love to die on the cross for us. Yeah, it's hard to know if he was perfect at it, but yeah, I think he did a really good job because he spent his whole lot of his life. He was righteous, so when we talk about righteousness, does everybody understand what that is? Somebody? Anybody? Righteousness? They tell us in the Bible pretty much, it's one of the main things they tell us about Joseph, he was righteous, which means that he, had, he was in correct relationship with God. He kept God at the front of his whole life. He, so he was righteous. And when I'm doing this, I'm talking about the relationship between somebody here on earth and God in heaven. So, uh, so Christian marriage is a relationship of life-giving love in which a man and a woman make the, the, make the love of Christ present in each other and become signs of the love of Christ to those around them. So do you guys know any couples? that are that way? You think you see Christ's love between them or between how they handle everything together as a couple of that, 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 that echoes or exemplifies Christ's love? Just think about that for a little bit. It's, it's, it's hard for us to do that, us married couples, <laughs> to, to try to emulate God's love. So I would tell you, Pam and I are good at it sometimes and we're pretty bad sometimes. Uh, and Pam's my wife, by the way, just in case anybody wondered. So the, the other thing I put up there was hate. A lot of people think that uh, hate is the opposite of love. And I'm not sure what the best definition for hate is. Maybe the absence of love. But in the theology of the body, it talks about lust being the opposite of love. And so lust is when you have a desire for something, and it could be anything, but in this instance we're talking about sex, then it outweighs your desire for the good for the other person. I want something, 
So I'm going to use you to get what I want. That's lust. And so lust is the opposite of love. And it's today we lust after lots and lots of things. We have lots of opportunities to want something of another of example that would be the, as opposed to lust, you know, envy. So you could think of envy kind of in the same light that you have this cool car, I want your car, or you have this nice house, I want your house. And one of the, the saints always talks about if we can be happy in the worst of all situations and give glory to God, then nothing else matters. So we did, we're just so blessed. Sometimes we lose sight of what's really important. But of does, does anybody have any questions on love? And as we talked about, it's not a partial thing, and it and it's emulates and shares in God's love. Or the example of God. <clears throat> so signs of God love, and I'm kind of going through the handout now for that number eight for marriage. Of, so it's, of a marriage is a sacramental. So like we talked about with the initiation sacraments a while ago, for a marriage to be valid in the Catholic Church as a sacramental marriage, both participants have to be baptized. And so, and it's a sacramental, marriage itself is a sacramental, it's a sign, again, back to Christ. If you remember in the, particularly in John's Gospel and some of the other Gospels, they talk about the bride, the church, and Christ, the bridegroom. And, and so that Christ and his love for the church, which is us, or is all humanity, actually, but some people don't choose to accept the church, the, uh, that is what's reflected in back to the, uh, to the married couple and that love that they have. And so one last thing before we get off of talking about love, well, we'll always be talking about love, but in particular is, so if you love 10 people, is that all you can love? I don't know, I ask little kids sometimes, but some people tend to view love as a pie. And so they can give a little bit out to lots of different people or a lot out to a few people. But uh, if we think about it that way, then we're not gonna be, have much love. We're not gonna share much love. And so with God, I don't know if infinite does it good, you know, it's good enough. God's outside of time, so, but, but with God, there's not, there's never too much love. The more you love, the more you will be loved. It just works out that way. So don't ever think, hey, that's one more person, I can't love them. No matter who it is or what it is. And you'll learn that in a, in a family situation. And of course, you guys growing up having siblings, hopefully everybody's had siblings, and so you, you, you like some of your siblings better, but you love all your siblings, right? And you love your parents, even though maybe dad's better today and mom's better tomorrow, whatever. You still, you still love and care for all those people. And as you go through your life, I don't know how many people you know now, but hopefully you have some love for all those people. And so in marriage, one of the things we have to do is freely. These are the four principles that the theology of body talks about. Free, total, faithful, and fruitful. And so with the first one, and freely, that means that you're not being married to them for any reason except for that you want to spend etern- your, the rest of your life with them here on earth. And so with that, when you start thinking about free and to love, it's a commitment for the rest of your life or their life, depending on who passes away first. And it's, uh, it's it initially, love can be an attraction, and it, there's got to be some reason that you start trying to find out who each other, each other are. But there's a point where your where your love or the desire to be together becomes a commitment. And so in marriage, it's a commitment to be and love no matter what happens. We talk about all the different stuff when you hear the different wedding vows, but whatever happens, we're going to give ourselves freely to that other person for the rest of our life. And of course, faithful is the rest of our life. Total is we don't hold anything back. So when we become a union, a husband and wife, then they're totally given to each other. Hopefully there's no secrets. There's no, 
of resentments. There's nothing, they, they've worked all that and had communication and they understand each other and they work in union as one. And so for this reason, this is one of the few, well, the only sacrament where the, who do you think the instru- or the, uh, the ministers of this sacrament, who, who, who is it? I know it's in a church in front of a priest, but who's a, who are the ministers of the sacrament of matrimony? I know you always know the answer. <laughs> Does anybody else have a guess? Is it the priest? Who is it then? It is a couple. The couple are the ministers for the sacrament of marriage. The priest is the official witness, and he blesses the marriage, but he's the official witness for the church. And then there's usually other witnesses there. That's why you have a best man and a matron of honor, and then all the other groomsmen and bridesmaids and all the other family. Everybody comes to celebrate because we want them to... uh, to understand they have support because marriage isn't something even though it's husband and wife and they go off you know they're living by themselves usually it's not uh, they're not alone you shouldn't especially with a church you should never feel like you're alone and you're married so we have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us God is love and whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him so that's from first John and John of course If you want to understand more about love, you just read John's gospel. We talked about the final discourse in his gospel two or three weeks ago, and it talks a lot about love, too, the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so love is self-giving, decision to give without resentment, forgive completely, and put the other's needs before our own. Of course, that's what we just talked about. How much better do you think the world would be if everybody truly loved each other? And so I was always more concerned about your needs than my needs. Some of the saints were able to embody that. A lot of us have trouble because I like my clothes. I don't want to give my clothes to you. I, I like my stuff, you know. It's hard for me to share everything with you. I'll be nice and give you 20 bucks, but, you know, that, that, you, it, it's just hard for us to be as loving as we should be. Hopefully our marriage teaches us that so we get more and more comfortable sharing our gifts. Uh, the saint for today, I think it was, that all the, well, no, it's a story I may read you in just a second if i got time. So I'll wait on that. But, uh, we talked about forgiving. I remember in the, when you guys go through the reconciliation, which we haven't talked about yet, but uh, the idea that we, for, we forgive because that allows us to be forgiven. So if we're stingy with forgiveness, God's not going to give us forgiveness. And in marriage, we learn about that. Um, and, of course, we talk about faithful, so that's all the days of our lives, a, a lifelong commitment that doesn't end. And so because it's a sacrament, it's, it's a covenant. It's not a contract. So anybody that thinks of a marriage as a contract, I guess you could go get, both of you get an attorney and write up a prenup, and you can go get married by the justice of peace, and you have a contract. I had a partner. We're not partners anymore. We broke our contract. We decided we're going to cut that out. And you have that option in a contract. But in the covenant, you don't, we don't have that option. Can I say something about covenant? Sure. So if we think about You want to take this so everybody? If we think about covenant in in terms of the Old Testament, what had to happen? Do you guys remember? So think about uh, Abraham and the covenant with Do you have any questions? It's important for us to get, grasp and understand in that sacramental marriage of the, the graces that we receive from God to be able to carry out the covenant. Um, 
So one of the things it talks about in your handout is love is intimate, joyful and intimate through mutual self-giving. And so every time, of, there, there's different ways to be intimate. We can think about the physical ways to be intimate, but you, there's other ways to be intimate. You, little notes that you leave for each other, uh, little things that you know that somebody likes, like there's certain foods that I really like. My wife picks those out once a week and feeds me good stuff. And so, and, it, and I'm probably not as nice to her as I should be, but, uh, so, but I know some of the things that she likes. She likes fresh flowers periodically and stuff like that. So, so we try to be nice and, and look for each other. So like I said, love is intimate. I mean, so it's, it, when I was talking about total, it's it, in that intimacy, you're totally giving yourself to each other. There's no, there's nothing about your life that you don't both already understand and accept and you're, and you're moving forward with that. And you're learning to share that with your kids and everybody else. So love is creative. Uh, so that means that we're open to the gift of life. And so when we talk about the two become one, there's no better example of that than to look at one of your kids if you're married and have kids. I uh, probably shouldn't look at my kids, but um, that, that, that union uh, that helps create human life. So God valued the human person enough to say you can participate in creation and that's how we participate in creation and if you got to hopefully i don't know if anybody was able to go did anybody get to go to the right to life walk yesterday in amarillo i actually had to be in lubbock but uh, so i didn't get to go but that's always uh, think about it every somewhere around january 22nd every year to, for roe v wade i think this is the 48th year since roe v wade and when we talk about marriage it's so critical to how we keep families strong and how we support life. And of course, yesterday was all about supporting life. Well, Father did a good job in his homily today talking about support of life. So, uh, so openness to children and raising children. And so, because it takes two parents to do the best job in raising children. And it's important for a daughter to know her dad, and it's important for a son to know her mom or his mom, because you get, there's so much stuff that you learn about how do you function in society when you have such a, uh, uh, those different relationships, and of course, and you, they know their siblings and stuff, so, so they already have social abilities from being in a family. And of course, the church does teach that marriage is between one man and one woman. That's a sacramental marriage. And we talked about God being revealed uh, in marriage because God is relation. And we talked about that before with the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfect union. Some people say that God the Father beget God the Son, and their love is the Holy Spirit. So, so does anybody have any questions about marriage? Because the next thing we're going to talk about is what everybody has stumbling blocks on. And so the church, is there a divorce in the church? So Christ told us that what God has put together, nobody should separate. So the church says, no, you can't get divorced. So what do we do if there's a union that needs to be separated? They call it annulment. And by that word, if you start thinking about that word a little bit, the idea is that they go through a process to establish whether the wedding was or the marriage was ever valid. So when I talk about these four things, we went over them. If they go back and prove that you were coerced to get married, uh, if somebody was drunk when they got married, didn't really know what they were doing, like you can't give yourself totally to somebody when you're drunk. <laughs> uh, they weren't faithful. I mean. Their intention, wasn't, their intention when they got married wasn't to be faithful for their whole life. There's different things like that that would make an annulment valid. It's difficult to establish it. It takes time. But the church has a process that they go through to say all the things that needed to be there for it to be a sacramental marriage didn't exist. And so they nullify it. So the next question that always came to my mind is, well, if that happens, what happens to the kids? Nothing. 
just because the parents didn't do what they were supposed to do, God, the church, isn't going to hold it against the children. So they're still valid in, the, in that union between those two people, even though they may separate. Is that, that's, a, that's a simplified version. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that people could ask questions we could discuss, but hopefully we won't go that way. Because what God joined together, nobody could separate. I mean, it, that's what Christ told us, right? So if, in, in Moses, and so that's what the Pharisees were giving Christ a hard time when he made that statement. What did they say to him? Moses allowed to give us a bill of divorce. You know why that was? The hardness of their own hearts. Well, the hardness of their hearts, but what they were doing, they could go to confession and confess that they killed their wife and, and do the penance and be forgiven. And they were doing that because they wanted to marry somebody else. And so to save that from happening, Moses allowed them to write a bill of divorce so they could separate so that they didn't kill their wife to go get another wife. Yes? Joe, what you were talking about, the contract versus covenant, that's, that's uh, similar. You know, when you get married in the church, you still have to have a, you still have to have a wedding license. You're still civilly married also. So if you want to get a divorce, that's a civil divorce. So as far as the state is concerned, you're no longer married. But a covenant is not so easily broken. When the two become one, how can you separate two things that became one? If you take all the, pla the Play-Doh and squish it together, you can't get the colors back out. You know what I mean? So, you, uh, so an annulment is really a process by which the church says the marriage never existed in the first place. It's not equivalent to a divorce. That's what the state does. Is, it, is that clear to everybody? Does anybody have any questions about that? I don't know what everybody's personal situation is, but the, those are some of the things that make it difficult to come from a different background and then join the church. Yes? Well, the Catholic Church, similar to baptism, views a marriage as valid until it's determined to not be valid. So in answer to your question, it would, they would view it just like a, a Catholic marriage. Now, if, if you married somebody outside the church and you were baptized and they weren't, I think that simplifies that whole process because in the Catholic Church, you, you can't marry somebody who's not baptized. For it to be a valid sacramental marriage, I shouldn't say you can't for it to meet the requirements of the sacramental marriage and to, to stay in union with the church. But, but still, even somebody that's married outside the church wants to come into the church and they've got a, they've got a divorce in their past, the, the church is going to look at it the same way. Does it have these four elements? Were those four elements present on the day you got married and throughout your marriage? And if they were not there, the church will just say that wasn't a legitimate marriage. That wasn't a sacramental marriage. It never so, existed. <laughs> so they can nullify a marriage that wasn't actually uh, a marriage that didn't happen as long as it was between baptized persons in the church. Uh, so I was married prior to, uh, well, way back <laughs> in my in my past. And so when I came into the Catholic Church, I had to I had to present my divorce decree and I had to write out details of my marriage and everything. I, so I had to go through a process, an annulment process, and I had to turn that in to, uh, to the diocesan office where it was put under review. Uh, so uh, so for, to speak Protestant, to anyone in the room, if, if you have a, a divorce in your past, you do have to submit that to the Catholic Church for them to, to, to rule on if those four things free total faithful fruitful uh yeah if you have more questions you can talk to me afterwards i went through the through the process so uh yeah well yep. and uh because because we're going to need to move on but I, yeah go ahead if you have a I think the marriage needs to be, uh, they would come to church and get it blessed in the church. I don't know if they're blessed or validated, validated in the church. 
So is there any other qu questions about that? Of, of the only thing I was going to ask Roman is mm -hmm. everybody thinks that process of trying to get an annulment is torturous, especially if the separation between the couples uh, wasn't amicable. In other words, they hate each other now, or well, maybe maybe hate the right word there. Of did it help? kind of heal some of those old thoughts and wounds or did it I, I felt like it yeah I, d I do feel like because I, I um I'd gone through counseling and everything again it was you know well in my past it was 20 something years ago but uh I do feel like it uh, I, I, I felt a difference whenever whenever there was a, a final ruling on it I felt like okay even in God's eyes now it's it's seen as as dissolved and mine Mine were, uh, it, the, the process was long because there's such a backlog. backlog. However, for, for mine, it was pretty cut and dry. Um, there was unfaithfulness on the spouse's part, and so that was pretty cut and dry. So, All right, well, thank you for that. Yeah. And so, so the last thing we talk about in, I'm sorry. You're the process you have to end in, in the church to interview both parties, mm -hmm. not just one, uh, to get both stories to make sure. And so they will try to contact yeah, the, the other spouse that may not have anything to do with the Catholic Church, but they'll do every effort to contact them and get both sides of the story so they can understand what really happened. Uh, it's and, and, and on my part, they, they could not get a hold of her. They did put it out there. They couldn't get a hold of her. And so because she did not, she, she either refused or they couldn't find her or whatever. Because of that, then they... That was also just a, a ruling in my favor. She didn't, she didn't respond. So, and, that, and sometimes that happens. It, it does lengthen the process because if everybody can answer the questions and basically agrees that it shouldn't, it probably wasn't valid in the church's eyes, the Catholic Church's eyes, uh, then it'll go, that'll go quicker than trying to find and wait in periods. And because I don't, they got to try to notify them so many times and all this kind of stuff. So. And, and, and we do that because we don't take marriage lightly. Uh, again, it's a lifelong commitment. If I'd have known what I know now, I don't know if I'd ever got married when I, was, when I got married. No, I shouldn't say that. But it, but it is, uh, I, I, that's what I, I encourage anybody. We taught this to the high school. Hopefully we're, starting to, we're still doing that some. I, I'm not teaching there anymore. But there, there's so much in here to unpack about what our bodies are made for and what God intended of that all lead to our vocation. And so right now we're talking about marriage, but there's also the vocation of, of holy orders and then like the religious and things like that. And some people are called a single life and that's a vocation as well. You don't have to get married or be a priest. That's not all your options as a guy or be religious and, and get married as a, a woman. You have other options. And so there's lots of things and still be active and vibrant and great in the, in the, in your community and in your church. So the last thing I wanted to mention on marriage is the, we, well, contraception is one of the things that always comes up. And what does the Catholic church say about that? The Catholic church says, we don't do anything that obstructs. We talk about giving ourselves totally if we obstruct the process of potentially becoming child bearers and being fruitful, if we block those things, contraception does that. And there's abortive contraceptions which basically kill it after it's been, after the uh, conception of the child. We don't, anything that affects that process is outside the teachings of the church. So there's something called natural family planning. And so Everybody in here, I wrote chastity at the top. Can you be married and be chaste? You can. <laughs> They're not inseparable. So you can have a spouse and procreate and still be chaste because you're in a faithful, fruitful union with just one person. And your, your view of each other is not how often can we have sex. It's when are we ready to make a union and when are we ready to have kids and natural family planning helps us to set that we were i mean we went to it but as our engagement counter all those years ago so it's not something that's brand new and and for us it worked well we were able to have five kids and space them out pretty well 
of and using natural family planning. But it says down here, it says no physical or chemical barrier is used. So we work within the woman's cycle of how things work and when she's most, has the best potential for becoming pregnant and the least potential for becoming pregnant. And we work inside of that to, to set our families up. And the only Pam, regret Pam and I have about doing all that stuff was that we thought we knew when we should quit. Sometimes we think we should have had other kids, but so. Does, does anybody, and of course that's about chastity, chastity according to the state, uh, it, into our state of life. And so if you're not married, chastity does mean that, that you're, because if we're willing the good of the other, like we talked about with love, we're, not, we're trying not to go to those places where we have thoughts about people that aren't pure, where we talk about people that aren't pure, and so that we're, we're staying in a chaste environment even though we're living by ourselves. And that, that, for anybody that has any other inclinations sexually, we ask everybody to maintain that same chaste love for everybody. So we're not really telling people that have a different inclination of th for them to do something different than we would for anybody except uh, that's outside of marriage. And so it's not okay to be outside of marriage and of having sex or thinking thoughts about sex or looking at pornography or there's a whole other slew of different stuff that we're not doing uh, if we're chaste. Because remember our bodies are holy, they're gifts from God. They're temples of the Holy Spirit. There's a soul in our body that all those things that we do with our body can stain it and makes it more and more difficult to make our way to heaven. Any other questions about, or any questions about marriage? So with that, we're going to talk briefly about holy orders. And I apologize, I told you guys last time, Joe is going to be here. If you went to Mass, uh, well, he texted me yesterday and said he was hoping he would be feeling better, but he's still on oxygen, and he is at home. But he's been had COVID for three weeks, and he's just not feeling that well. So keep him in your prayers, because he can definitely use our prayers, and I hopefully... I mean, it sounds like he feels like he's, he's starting to feel better, so he's on a mend, I think. But uh, it's, and, and we talk about it a little bit, some people don't seem to be bothered by it at all, and some people it really affects them, so. Um, <coughs> just because he just went through all the orders. But. So uh, that's that handout number C9, of Sacrament of Holy Orders. <coughs> and that's where I had a story in here. So this is, it's called a story starter out of this uh, Theology of the Body book that says, a waste or a gift. So at a Catholic high school in Detroit, Brian Walsh enjoyed the popularity that came with being a captain of the basketball team. Although he would go to mass with his family on Sunday morning, there was no telling where he'd been the night before. Like many of the other students in his school, Brian would always be at parties and would often get drunk. He also slept with his girlfriend like looking at porn and didn't use the cleanest language. Needless to say, it was quite a surprise to, for his friends when he announced at the end of his senior year that he was going to enter the seminary. <clears throat> he was pretty much the last guy on campus that anyone could see becoming a priest, but he responded to a quiet call he felt deep under the noise and excitement of the social life. Since he came from a wealthy family, he wasn't quite prepared for the austere seminary room that he was given, bare floors, no air conditioning, etc. So he quickly remedied this situation and brought in wall-to-wall -wall carpet and a television set, a stereo, as well as his favorite whiskey, a few porn magazines, and an air conditioner. This is somebody that's going to a seminary. He would, have off, he would often invite the other seminary guys to his room for a party. They soon agreed he wouldn't last long. However, toward the end of his first year in seminary, he attended a silent retreat with the rest of the young men. 
In the time he spent in recollection, recollect, recollection, he heard the call of Christ again. He responded. He realized he had been living a double life and no longer wanted to settle for mediocrity. He quit cursing, gave away all his luxuries, and trashed the porn and whiskey. What possessions he had left, he gave to the poor, including his car. <clears throat> when his second year of seminary began, he was assigned to a poor parish in St. Louis. Living at the rectory, he would often meet the poor people who would show up at the doorstep looking for help. Initially, he would offer them some donated food or clothing, but, when he, but then he began to give away his own clothes. When he ran low, he'd go to the closets of the priest and give away their clothes. <clears throat> he would strip the blankets off the beds, toss in their pillows, and even donate the food they were all supposed to eat for dinner. It didn't take long for the priest to set Brian down for a chat. They appreciated his charity, but said that he, if he kept this up, they wouldn't have anything left to give to the poor. They suggested that perhaps he was called to a life of more radical form of Christian poverty. He took their advice and began working in India with Mother Teresa, which is Saint Mother now, <coughs> Saint Mother Teresa. After some time with her, he spent, he sent, she sent him to do missionary work in <clears throat> Vietnam and Cambodia. While in Cambodia, the communists violently persecuted the church and told all missionaries to get out of the country. In a letter to the seminarian's friends back in the United States, Brian wrote, if I, am <clears throat> if I am asked to leave, I will stay because I feel called to mix my blood with the blood of Christ for the salvation of these people's souls. So sure enough, Brian's call was fulfilled each day at 4 a.m., he would sneak out in darkness to Mass. But on one particular morning, he was followed by communist soldiers who arrested him during Mass, pulled him out of the cathedral, and beheaded him outside the church. He was 23 years old. Some people will look at the young man's martyrdom and think, what a waste. Others will see the witness and example, what a gift. So when we talk about the holy orders, there's lots of different just like in marriage and single life, there's lots of different ways that people fulfill their calling. And, and we're all called to listen to those ways so that we can find the will of God in our life. And we're not all told to do the same thing, right? And so this particular guy felt that way. Some of our saints felt that way. They, they took on things that most of us wouldn't do. They were very austere. They basically tortured themselves sometimes because they felt called as repentance for things they had done and for other people. And they understood the depths of Christ's love and so they were willing to give them themselves. Paul talks about it, that we are poured out like a libation. Everybody understands what he's basically talking about over his whole life. He's giving himself away piece by piece until he was actually beheaded. And so we can do that. We talk about the blood of martyrs, so a red martyrdom but a lot of us have a white martyrdom. So if we're loving, like we talked about a while ago in marriage, and, and priests are called to be just as loving as we are to be in, in, a, in a union with the, their parishioners and with their, everybody that they deal with. Uh, but they're gonna, you, you could have a white martyrdom, we call it, so that your whole life is being poured out for somebody, for everybody else. You're not concerned about yourself. So you're truly showing Christ's love. <clears throat> Because there's another story in here that talks about Maximilian Kolbe. Does everybody know who he was and what he did? I actually got to go with my, took two of my daughters and we went to World Youth Day in Poland. God, it seems like it was just the other day, but it's probably five or eight years ago. Uh, but we went to Auschwitz after, uh, World, after the World Youth Day week. Of, it was surreal, heavy. It was just hard to know what happened there walk around and see all the stuff that they where they gas people and burned them up and, uh, that all started uh, with the nazis they started lying to people and telling them they were going to help them they went to all the jews and said if you'll come we'll, we'll protect you from these we're in a world war and they're after you we're going to protect you so they put them in these prison camps and then they started killing them of course it wasn't very long everybody started figure, figuring out what was going on so nobody wanted to go to the camp anymore so when we talk about that it, it, so colby was he got herded in there, put in the camp, and he gave his life for another prisoner who had family. And 
he didn't die right away. They, they, start, they put him in a starvation bunker, and they finally killed him because he wouldn't die. They gave him carb carbonic acid, is that right? Gave him a shot of that. that basically, just burned him up, his bloodstream, but burned it up, so it killed him. So when we talk about that uh, in the sacrament of holy orders. It's like, again, some people are called to that, but not everybody's called to that. That's where you've got to listen to God. But the, he gives you the strength to, to fulfill what he calls you to do. Um, so, and, and Father talked about it a little bit this morning. So all of us, everybody that's baptized Christian or that intends to be baptized Christian, participates in the priesthood of Christ. We're all called to be priest, prophet, and king as part of the church. And again, when we talk about confirmation and stuff, that's what we're saying is we're all called through that priest, prophet, and king to be witnesses for Christ. So that puts us all in a common priesthood. <clears throat> so holy orders confers a sacred power for the service of the faithful. The ordained minister exercises their service for the people of God by teaching divine worship and pastoral governance. So they, are, they feel called. A lot of them, you talk to them, some of them will hit them like a brick when they were 40, and some of them when they were three years old or eight years old felt like they were called to be a priest. Some people run away from it, similar to some of us in our vocation. Uh, they don't want to go there, <laughs> but it doesn't usually work out very well. Uh, Jonah is a great example of that, right? We heard the end of the story where he did go to Nineveh, but you know he spent some time in the belly of a well or a fish or whatever because he didn't do what God told him to do at first. And so he's basically like, I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. So after he spent some time in the belly of a well and got thrown up on the beach, then he finally decided, well, <laughs> I better do what God told me to do. So he heads to Nineveh. You know, the other part of that story, he was mad at God because he relented of the evil he promised to do to them. Jonah wanted him to take care of that city, wipe it out. And of course, since they repented of their sin, God gave them, he had mercy on them. But Jonah didn't like that. He went through all that trouble and he didn't kill them all. Uh, <clears throat> they practiced divine worship by administering sacraments and leading blessings and prayers. They govern a diocese and, or parish. And so when we talk about holy orders, of where did it start? Did the church just make it up? Somebody say something? But Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit infused them to where they would go out, but I would tell you it started before that. So, so in, the, in the Last Supper, Christ in, institutes a priesthood with... He gives up giving of himself, of uh, giving them the bread and the wine and starting that process. And those that were there with him were going to be able to participate in that. They were the first bishops. The apostles were the first bishops for the church. But you're right. At Pentecost, they had the nerve to actually go outside <laughs> with the knowledge and the grace that they had received. And so it took all that different stuff to happen. And, of course, between the resurrection and Pentecost, the apostles got to understand more about what Christ was wanting them to do because they were still hoping for a, or most likely they were still hoping for a military leader, not a, a, a sacrificial leader. And so, um, and of course that comes out of Matthew 10, he gave the, and he gives the power to heal and forgive. That's when he's talking to the apostles and sends them out. Of course, that was before he was crucified. If you remember, he sends them out and then he sends the 72 out and they're all fascinated by the powers that he's granted them to be able to heal and and uh, of uh, drive out demons and do all the different stuff and some of the things that even Christ hadn't done <clears throat> so the laying on of hands is one of the things that happens in, for holy orders and so not that the Holy Spirit can't convey himself but it's a sim symbol of some of the stuff from the Old Testament if you remember like when uh, David was anointed king they laid hands on him and poured oil on him and of course that's one of the other things that will be part of the holy orders is they'll be, they'll be anointed with the, the, oil of, the oil of holy orders 
And so uh, <coughs> it says some additional rites include an anointing with chrism, the bishop and the priest, presentation of ring, mitre and crozier, excuse me. So everybody's anointed with chrism and then the bishop and priest presented with a ring, mitre and crozier to the bishop. So the mitre is the stick, right? And the crozier is the hat? Or the, the whatever, is I got it backwards? Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. So the crozier is the is a uh, staff, like a shepherd's staff, and then the mitre is the, the cap that he wears, not the cap, but the hat that he wears. Of <coughs> giving the book of gospels. So if you haven't ever gone to an ordination of a deacon and or a priest, I encourage you to try to go sometime in the future. Of I don't know that we have any, we kind of ran out of people that were ready. Uh, now we will, we're start, they started a deaconate class and I think it's four and a half, five years from now before it's over. And then we do have some seminarians that are going through that would be ordained, but I think they're two or three years out. So it may be a little while, but we could, maybe Lubbock or somebody else, will maybe we can start paying attention to some of our sister dioceses. And if anybody was interested, we could try to make a trip down to go watch one. But it's fascinating. Uh, there's so much symbolism and beauty in the whole process of the, of the ordination. <clears throat> so leaders of the early church. Um, only those who were ordained to the priesthood had the power to preach in the assembly, celebrate the Eucharist, and guide the faith community. So Christ called, he didn't, he, the Last Supper wasn't out for everybody to see and everybody to participate in. He had particular people that he had called and had followed him for that whole time that he was gonna entrust this ministry to, but he also tells them to go out and spread it through all the world. Well, they realized pretty quick that just 12 of those, well, yeah, 12 after they picked Bartholomew to help them, they, they couldn't do it all. So they had to find helpers. And so that's when the church started to grow and to spread. And we talked about it before, but through holy orders, uh, Deacon Gabe over here, he's in that line of succession all the way from Jesus to Peter down to uh, Bishop Zurich and then to, to Gabe. And I guess at the time it was probably, that was pre-Yanta. Was uh, Matheson, is that who ordained you? Yes. Yeah. So Bishop Matheson. So two two bishops ago. Uh, so this has in the order in here, what are the degrees of holy orders? I'm gonna start with the deacon at the bottom because to me it makes more sense that way. Um, so they may assist the celebrant at mass, distribute the Eucharist, perform baptisms, officiate at weddings and funeral services, lead prayer, preach and teach. The focus of the deacon's ministry is charity caring for the community, especially those in need. Typically, unless they're actually working for, and doing something else besides being a deacon at the diocese, deacons are not paid. So Deacon Gabe <laughs> has given his time freely for, how long have you been doing? Almost 25 years. 25 years. Well, I don't know, we can round up. Uh, and of course his wife, has participated with him in all that stuff. And so when people become a deacon, they're not all by themselves if they're already married. Can they get married after they become a deacon if they weren't married before? No, they can't. And if their wife dies while they are a deacon, if, if they were already married when they became a deacon, they can't remarry. So they're making a commitment to stay with that one, well, it's a commitment we're all supposed to make except for the fact that they if my wife dies, I can get remarried if I find it the second perfect person. I can't imagine that, but uh, so, but it, the deacons, and so one of the other things, the deacon is one of the only people well, in the church can, can participate in all of the sacraments because they can be married and can have holy orders. And so there's two types of deacon. One is a permanent deacon like Deacon Gabe he didn't have intentions of going on to become a priest. And one of them is a transitional deacon. And the, those that are in the seminary become a transitional deacon at some point in their seminary training before they become a priest. But they're in the, their intention is the transition from deacon to priest. And so priest, it says, therefore, 
they ordain men to act in their place. Again, this is talking about as the apostles grew and the church grew. Of, and if you remember the first 250, 300 years, the church was being persecuted, but it was still growing. And so when I read that story earlier and that guy was willing to give his life in Cambodia, <clears throat> the church has always been able to grow and bring people to it because it's kind of hard to explain, but people are willing to believe in something that somebody else is willing to die for. If, if we all just have words and we just talk about stuff, you're going to convince some people to get on board, but some people are going to say, I want something more than that. I want to see action. I want to understand why, why do you care for Christ? I know there's a story a long time ago where a guy, he, he went through baptism class with a bunch of other people, and they actually baptized him in a river, and, but he stood on the sideline. He wasn't ready to get baptized. He wanted to see if baptism really changed the people that were being baptized before he was going to do that. Hopefully, all those people that were baptized changed enough that he was convinced to go ahead and be baptized himself. But So when we talk about that, we're, as baptized Christians, priest, prophet, and king, we're called to be, go out and, and have actions, not just prayers and words. Not that those aren't important, but they need to be followed by action. Uh, so priests can celebrate the sacrament of baptism, Eucharist, penance, the anointing of the sick, and can be the official witness at weddings. He may celebrate confirmation with the bishop's permission. And I think we talked about that briefly in here. When you guys are confirmed at the Easter Vigil, hopefully everything works out and we can actually do it at the Easter Vigil of, oops, excuse me, that thing, of the, uh, um, the, uh, the bishop, Zurich, can't be at all the masses. Everybody's gonna have their mass at basically the same time sunset on the Easter Vigil, which is this year will be April 3rd. Of, but everybody can't be there. And so, or he can't be everywhere, I should say. Everybody can be there. But the, so he'll give the priest the ability to do the confirmation for you guys. Now all of our kids that come through and go through, he sets up a time all the way through the summertime, basically, to be at different parishes all over the diocese to do confirmation for the kids himself. But again, since everybody's getting confirmed on the same night and I don't know how many, 45 parishes or whatever we have in our diocese. He can't be all, at all those places, so he allows a priest to do the confirmation. And so then the last, this is, does anybody have any questions about the difference between the deacon and the priest? And deacons in, in the U.S. church, deacons are something that kind of went away for a while, and I think Gabe was one of the first in the, one of the first groups that when it started coming back and becoming stronger again. And I think we had 15 last, well, it was supposed to be June. I don't remember now when it ended up being August or something. Yeah, it was August 15th because I couldn't go. Well, I couldn't go because of COVID. They wouldn't have let me, but I couldn't have gone because my wife got married, or my wife, my daughter got married uh, that day. But it, so it was August 15th. So we had 15 new deacons. And of course, it blessed us with Joe, Deacon Joe, that we're praying for because he's sick. But so he hadn't been a deacon very long. And I think it was a four and a half, five year process to do that. Um, and so, does anybody have any questions about those differences? So then the bishop, who is a bishop? And then we talked about these are degrees of holy orders. Of, so each bishop ensures the unity of the local church with the universal church. So what is the universal church? church throughout the world and who it, besides being the bishop of Rome who is the, the bishop of the, the, the whole church the Pope and my son was asking me why didn't the Pope tell the bishops what to do well it doesn't work quite that way although they work together and they're supposed to be in union with each other each bishop is in charge of his diocese and he's supposed to maintain I think we said that a while ago of unity of his church, local church, with the universal church. But Pope Francis isn't going to come over and tell Bishop Zurich what to do every day. He's going to trust, he, he, he or one of his predecessors appointed Bishop Zurich to the position of bishop, and he's going to trust that Bishop Zurich knows what to do, and I think they're still doing it every so often, not with COVID, everything may have got scooted back, but each bishop 
around the world goes and has an audience over a three or four year period with the Pope and talks to them about what they're doing in their diocese and they just discuss basically, I think it's an idea to how are we, are we staying in union? Are we talking about the same things? Are we, are we trying to do the same? Are we all upholding the magisterium, the teaching arm of the church? And it says uh, the bishop can officiate at all seven sacraments. And so the only sacrament that the priest can't do that the bishop does is holy orders. And so for the conferring of holy orders to a deacon, a priest, or another bishop has to be done by a bishop. Does all that make sense? And so of the, all of them are called to holy orders. All of them have a function in the church. And they're all, we, we tend to think of everything in hierarchy, right? Of, but although the bishop appoints and moves the priest around and tries to keep everybody in union with Rome, of, they're all, in a priestly sense, they're all equal. They all can confer, with the exception of holy order, they all confer the same thing, the bishop and the priest. And of course, sometimes priests are, so there's different priests, some priests are, we doing our time? Yeah, we're close to the end. Is everybody going to Mass? And so the last thing I'll talk about is celibacy. So uh, why celibacy? Well, the first thing I'll tell you is Christ was celibate. And these people that have been called by the Holy Spirit are intended to emulate Christ. We say persona Christi for the priest, so he's in the function of Christ. We talked about it a little bit before of uh, the video we watched on the Eucharist. You know, that priest became Christ, and although that was a great visual scene, we don't see it that dramatic in our church, but that's exactly what happens. That priest is functioning as Christ. He's bringing what Christ did for us to the present, and he's functioning that way. And so that's part of one of the reasons that celibacy of the other thing is, is it's difficult, and uh, I don't know, maybe Roman can speak to some of that stuff because he he's got a family and he was in ministry in a different church. It's sometimes it's hard to, to make a choice between what does my family need and what does the church need. And if you don't have a family outside of the family of the church, then you can dedicate yourself completely to the church. And we appreciate men that receive that call and, and follow that call. <coughs> uh, And so it even talked about Paul prays celibacy as a means of focusing on the affairs of the Lord. And that's from 1 Corinthians. And then we talk a little bit about women and men religious. And so typically they can take a vow of celibacy because they wish to serve God wholeheartedly. Of St. Agnes, this last week was one of the martyrs that we, we witnessed to. I think she was 12 to 14 years old. and. Uh, she had a lot of suitors, and one of them didn't like the fact that she said, no, I don't want to get married. I'm giving myself to God, which basically meant she was a Christian. He turned her over, and she was tortured and killed. And so that when we talk about, uh, and I, I, I keep talking about people that died, right, in defense of Christ, but that's what the church is built on. And we're not all called to that, but we may be. And I pray if I ever was, I'd do the right thing. But so it says in here, there is no one who has given up house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or lands for the sake, for my sake or for the sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundred times more now in this present age and eternal life in the age to come. That's from Matthew 10. And so when we talk about our priests, deacons, holy orders, religious, that have given up everything to follow Christ, not that everybody shouldn't be following Christ. I don't want to, if there's a dichotomy in that, we, it need, we need all of us. That's why we don't all have the same vocation. If everybody were priests, who would they serve us to, right? <laughs> but if, every, if, if it were all priests, there wouldn't be a whole lot of kids running around. And so, so it takes all of us, the two vocations, for the church to thrive and survive. One of the things I skipped over was ulterianism. Does anybody know what the ter that term is, what it means? Yes. So, so, so this is just a fancy word for saying you're using people. So the opposite of love. 
Um, and then we talked about celibacy. I think I've covered everything I put up there. Does anybody have any questions?